The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We're looking at verse 27 through 30. We're in a special on Wednesday night called Missionary Evangelism. And the, the little book of Philippians is really a great book on this subject matter. Um, Paul really liked the Philippians. Little Church of Philippi really did phenomenal stuff. Here we are in verse 27, chapter 1, Philippians. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know why they're suffering? We saw it last night. For the, for the word of God and for the testimony of the gospel. Suffering for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to talk about understanding the mission from the field perspective. Once you go to the mission field, you really get an understanding about what foreign missions is about. You can sit and study it all day long, but... Once your boots hit the field and you, you really have a hands-on life experience with it, then you're able to walk away and understand what, at least for that field, what is important in their spiritual needs. But Paul says we ought to live that way whether we're on the home field or the foreign field. We ought to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, whether I'm there or here or there should be that standard that we set. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit the privilege to do inventory spiritually of your life to be sure that you study the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living, and that requires the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you to examine your life in regard to personal sin Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and avert sins, these should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. 1 John 1 9, dealing with sanctification, says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you say, You said that's important for sanctity. It is because it's a believer's life in regard to the Holy Spirit. Personal sin is, is a result of carnality, carnality, you confess it and get back into spirituality, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I give you a moment to do that, both those who are with us in our study as well as those who are home on the internet. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us on the subject of missionary evangelism. This occurs on the home front as well as the foreign front, uh, being a missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ and ambassadorship is so important to our existence as a church, as custodians of the word of God and evangelism. <clears throat> I pray tonight, Father, that we would be able to see how important it is both on the home front of missions as well as the foreign front. And we're talking about how important it is once you get your feet engaged in mission work, the things that you learn that, uh, that are capable of 
developing a ministry out of your life uh, based on needs of the people on the field rather than a pre preconcept of what you think they might need. Once you get there, you see what they really do need. So we, 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 we pray for that to, to look at how Paul discovered these things, and we'll look at what Paul discovered and see if it could be beneficial to our life as a missionary and ambassador for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Last week we studied how Paul clarified his westward direction of ministry uh, off of his second missionary trip when uh, he was in Asia Minor and got the call to go westward and the rest of his life was to follow that, that lead and um, with the exception of one time when he went east, uh, Paul did, did great in that direction. And we're reminded when Paul went east rather than west how important it is to pay attention to the directive will, the details of the directive will of God. When God tells you to go one direction, you go to another direction. Just like Jonah, you find out that's not a good idea. So, you know, once you hit spiritual maturity and maintain it, then you've got to pay attention to details, details of the will of God. The book of Acts, when you look at Paul's missionary trip, three of them are recorded. Many of us believe that Paul made a fourth trip uh, somewhere between 62 and 66 to Spain. But it's not recorded in Acts. Uh, but he talked a great deal about it. Whether he ever went or not, nobody knows. But he did talk a lot about it. And he had the time to do it. But because it's not recorded, all three of them are recorded. So everybody says Paul had three missionary trips. Okay? We're going to look at five things that I think, as I've looked at Paul's three missionary trips out of the book of Acts over the years, I'm going to tell you five things that Paul learned, that when I talk to missionaries on the mission field, that they learn. I mean, it's just interesting that when you study what Paul learns, and said, this is what I learned, and this is how I adjusted my ministry to it. Everybody who gets their feet on the mission field, whether it be local or foreign, they discover the same thing, because you go with an idea in your mind of what you would like to present. And once you get there, you find out, oh, wait, now I know what they really need. Sometimes you can adjust on the field and sometimes you can't. But what happens is when you, when you come home and you, if you ever make a second trip, you, you make your adjustments because now you've got a sense of what they need. Now, sometimes you have a missionary on the field and he can tell you what they are. And it's always good to have good sound counseling and paying attention to the guy who's got his boots on the field. Uh, to give you an idea of what he believes their needs are. But as a rule, you go the first trip out, you go on what's in your heart to share, not knowing. And then when you get there, when you come back, you, you make adjustments and go, like, if I went back, I go back again. And, and Paul's going to tell you wh why, why it's important to go back again and how you should evaluate that. So I'm going to talk about five things that, I believe Paul learned um, from understanding the mission field, understanding the mission from the field. You know, this is true with home missions too. You know, you you go to the you go to the retention centers, or you go to the nursing homes, or or you go to the high schools, or wherever you go. Quote: You get your feet wet, and you learn a lot about just the ropes, just. There's just a whole lot of things that, that you have to learn just about the exercise of getting there, being in a pocket of uh, volition. I mean, there are all kinds of things. Sometimes it's traveling. Sometimes it's weather. Sometimes it's structures. There's all kinds of things. Sometimes people require things from you. Um, there's just a whole lot to it. And so once your feet get, once you get in it, then you go like, hmm. So... Here's the first thing. Here's the first thing. 
that I think Paul learned. This is just purely my observation from his trips. And, and what I, I listen to other, other, I'm interested in always talking to missionaries that I know that go to the field and stay that really give you a, a heads up. And so here, Paul learned that here, here and everybody's going to learn this. Man, I don't care where you're going on home missions or foreign missions, you're going to learn that positive volition is one of the big things that Paul learned, and he teaches about it all the time. If he writes a book, when he writes a book to the Romans or the Corinthians or the Ephesians or the Galatians, I mean, when he writes a book back to these people, he's going to talk about this. And that is positive volition at God consciousness. When he writes back to the Romans, in the first chapter, he talks about how important it was to relate to people on the order of creation. For, that's just for an example. Uh, when he got out there, you know, it was one thing when he's dealing with Jews. When he got out dealing with Gentiles, he had to adjust his whole, his whole idea of approaching people. And uh, the character of God became a big issue. And so one of the things that, that Paul learned that was important to him he understood it before he went, but then when he got, got on the field, it drove it home. And that is positive listening that God consciousness allows God to give a gospel hearing. It's a wonderful thing when you wind up, when you wind up on the other side of an open door, and that is into the ministry. You should have the confidence to know. Now, it's not going to be without conflict. But you, because Paul says that, doesn't he say it? Now you're experiencing some of the conflict I had. When I, when I brought the gospel to you, I, w I was in great conflict. Now you're taking the gospel to other people. Now you're finding what conflict is. I mean, the devil does a lot of things to hinder you. The main thing is to make sure that what he's hindered you is outside you and not in you. R agreed? And because you expect it outside. But if it ever gets inside, he, he's got you. <laughs> he's got you for a while anyhow. So always deal with this stuff on the outside. Do not let him inside. So uh, Paul learned that, that God consciousness allows God to give gospel hearing. So when you wind up on the other side of the door, there's one thing you know for certain, that there is positive volition there. You would have not been sent. And, and, and listen, the first... The first positive listen that you've got to tap into is God consciousness. That's how you're going to relate to the person. I mean, you've got to relate to him on a God conscious level in order to give him a gospel hearing. And so you're going to find Paul always testing, no matter who he's with. It doesn't matter if he's with, with Nicodemus, uh, a, a, you know, a religious guy, <clears throat> or somebody that just walked out of a fucking temple. He is going to test their volition towards God. <clears throat> he goes to Athens. What's he do? He, he looks at all the idols and the, boom, there he is. I mean, he's all over. He says, hey, I see you got an unknown God. Let me talk about the unknown God. I mean, I don't need to talk about the God you know about. Let me talk about the God you don't know about that I've come to tell you about him. See, <clears throat> so he starts there. So this is very important that you, when you, when you wind up at a nursing home because the door opens or a high school and the door opens or the Philippines or Myanmar or wherever you're going, I mean, understand that the fact that you're going is an open door. The fact that you got in is an open door. And on the other side of that door is positive volition. First, you have to tap it into God consciousness, and then you tap it into gospel hearing. Right? And everybody has a method to do that. Um, I guess Horton, I haven't heard him in a pretty good while. Next time he gets around my area, I'm going to go visit him. But he always used humor. He always used something that young people, he, he, had, he was with young people, he always used something to tap in to see if, if, I could, if they would be, uh, are, will you let me talk to you? you know, a common denominator, will you let me talk to you? And... Um, and that's, and if they do, and it takes you just a little bit, but once you get that, once you, whatever your method is, uh, the person eases up, settles down, relaxes, boom, now you got it. Because they've given you permission to talk. That's a wonderful thing. And uh, everybody's got their own little niche in how to do it. 
But what you're doing is you're testing volition. You're testing positive volition in that group. Are you going to get 100% all the time? No. no. Of course not. You're not there. I mean, only guy I ever knew that ever went out and got 100% was Jonah when he finally went. I mean, he got everybody. I mean, he got even, even the cats liked him. You know, the little dogs and cats. I mean, that's... I mean, he talks about it. It's pretty amazing. Well, um, one of the things that Paul learned, I think, through his conversion experience, and he talks about it, it will serve you well to listen to Paul's personal testimony in the book of Acts. That so I wrote down your paper. It will serve you well to listen to how he talks to people uh, with his personal testimony. You know, when you're with a group of people and you're in an unbelieving group of people, your testimony sometimes, if you have one, you should have one of some nature with God, is a very powerful tool. And you're going to see Paul use it at, at, like some people, listen, I'm not a guy that can walk into a group of people like Horton can and just connect with humor. If I did that, uh, they pick up phones. Okay? I'm not that guy. I am not that guy. But everybody's got to have a quote stick, you know, a stick of some way uh, to do that. Now, for, Paul used testimony. He used his testimony. A and he had quite a bit of testimony. I use mine a lot. When, when I, when I use my testimony to connect with people. That's what I do. I mean, that's my stick, so to speak. You know, when I say stick, I don't mean a stick. I mean a shtick. Um, so, you know, everybody, and listen, if you don't have one, then come up with one. They come up with a, a way to introduce the idea of testing somebody's positive listen for God and yada, yada. I mean, I, mean, I think because I wasn't converted until I was 23, I could connect with a lot of people, young people especially, those that are, you know, 12 to 23, I can connect with them, just boom, because I know, I know what it's like to be lost between 12 and 23. <clears throat> and so, you know, I got a lot to relate about that and then my conversion experience. Well, anyhow... <clears throat> You got to tap in there. And so Mr. Farmer was really wise about this. Mr. Farmer said, don't assume in America that everybody understands God. Don't assume that everybody understands God anywhere. <laughs> I mean, they may understand there is a God, but they don't understand God. So for him, always tapping into who God is is a very important issue because people are all over the place when it comes to an understanding about God. Uh, one of the things I like about Paul, Paul is in court, in one of his testimonies, what, and it's, it's well worth your read. Now, I wrote it down. In chapter 26, he's in court, and, and, and he, in court, he is, he is working people to see how, if they're God conscious. And I wrote it down in chapter 26, 19 through 28. You read it later and watch him work. He's at court. He's in court. And he's working the judges for salvation. And this is the one where Felix says to him, Paul, you've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. I said almost. It's a marvelous, watch him work. It didn't matter where he was. His, he always felt that wherever he wound up, that's where God had put him. That was an open door to the court system and to the high officials. And here's what's interesting to me. When Paul got saved in Acts 9, and, and God sent Ananias, sent Paul to Ananias, told Ananias, gave Ananias a heads up. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm selling, sending Saul of Tarsus to you. 
brother, that's a phone call he didn't want. Right? D have you heard of Saul of Tarsus before? Oh, oh I mean, fear fell over your heart. And 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 he's got he's got death certificates in his back pocket <laughs> in Damascus where Ananias is. <laughs> And he says, look, I'm sending Saul over to you. I want you to have a serious come to Jesus meeting with him. And he goes, uh, okay. And he tells him something really interesting. He says to Paul, he says, Paul, the Lord has told me what your ministry is going to be like. You're going to go to the Gentiles. You're going to speak to kings and important people. Now, he probably thought, like most of us, that he'd be like Billy Graham and he would be invited to Russia to speak to the... We would probably always put a good spin on that. He did get before kings and, and magistrates, usually in chains, like in this case. But Ananias told him, he said, you're going to speak before kings and, he, and so he gives him a heads up. You know what he tells him? He said, I want the gospel preached wherever you go. That's what he told him. I'm going to put you in front of all kinds of people. I'm sure he didn't think, well, I'll be before kings because they're going to chop my head off. I'm sure he probably put a wonderful spin to it like all of us do. Uh, Rod, I'm going to call you to be a pastor. Okay, I'm, I bet I'll have one of those big mega churches. Because I'm that kind of a guy. I can, oh, I can build it. I can do this thing. Yeah. <laughs> then he says, well, you know, I didn't, that's, where did you get that idea? I just said, you were going to teach. Then I told you it never matters how many, right? Right. Well, where did this multitude come from? <laughs> As a way to, so he tells Paul that. Ananias says, look, and he says, listen, you're going to speak before kings and, and magistrates and there's going to be something. And you're going to suffer a great deal. For the gospel. And boy, did Paul ever. And we're reminded in the book of Philippians, aren't we? In the first chapter, verse 29, not only to believe, but to suffer for my name's sake. Listen. As an ambassador for Christ, wherever you are, you look around, you go like, this is a strange place I'm in. Well, who opened the door? Well, I certainly didn't. Well, then it must have been God. So let's preach the gospel, buddy. Yeah, but it's a hospital. I don't care. Well, it's, it's the court system. I don't care. See, that's what an ambassador for Christ does. And what Ananias told Paul is that I want you to be an ambassador for Christ. He just told him in, 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 in technical terms. I mean, we are, are we not all ambassadors for Christ in Christ? I mean, it's a positional truth. How come we don't spend enough time thinking about where, where our periphery is? I mean, I learned from Chuck Farmer. When when you go to when you go to the hospital for whatever cause, I'm just going to visit. I'm not staying. Thank you. There, listen. There's a ministry there. You wouldn't go. How many times you go to a hospital? Just well, I think I'll stop by. There's bound to be somebody in here I could visit with. The only person I ever know did that was Chuck Farmer. Now Chuck Farmer would actually do that. He would go up to I, the waiting rooms. He would, go, he would go and spend a whole 
half a day in waiting rooms going from one to the other, talking with people in there because they were just glad to have somebody. Do you mind if I have a word of prayer with you? Oh, why? why? I would love that. Oh, by the way, <laughs> it's all the guy I ever knew who did it. But then I've known people that, that visit jails that way or, or, or Salvation Army people like that. So, you know what that is? Listen to me now. That's an ambassador for Christ. See? So I think that way now. I think that way. I'm going to the grocery store. Oh, yeah? For what? Well, I'm getting some milk and some eggs and that. Yeah, for what? Well, for lunch and for dinner. But I got a list. Jane gave me a list. For what? I know. I know I'm going to look. When I go, there, I look. I'm going to do it. I'm going to look for somebody that needs Christ. And I'll get the milk and put it in my buggy. And he says, you looking around? Well, I got the milk. Are you looking around? So, it, yeah, I might as well go prepared to do that instead of being hammered. Yeah. Did you talk to anybody? Did you talk to anybody? You want, listen, you're leaving the store. Right, have you talked to anybody? Look, I'll talk to somebody here. Let me look around. And you know what? There's always somebody. The darnest thing I ever saw. Well, anyhow. Please spend some time and read Paul's. His conversion is nine. His testimonies in 22 and 26. Please read his testimonies. Because he uses them. He uses his testimony as a door knocker. That's what we used to call them, door knockers. Way in, knock on doors, see if anybody's home and let me in talk. You know, there are a lot of people that'll talk if you'll knock on the door. Do you know that? It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Well, anyhow, a principle. Here's an important principle that you got to learn. God will bring, bring, will bring people to the gospel or the gospel to people. He'll do it one way or the other. He'll bring somebody to you or take you to somebody. And that's for sure. A good example of that is in Acts 8, Philip. Philip was on his way going to someplace else. I mean, he's already got another gig lined up. And just making good time, not busy on the highway. The Holy Spirit says, take a sharp left. So they end up down there. There's this dirt road and dead end. They end up down there. Nobody ever goes down that road. That's, that's a road that goes nowhere. Well, today it goes somewhere. I said, take a left. There's nothing down there. There's nothing down there. It's just an old dirt road. There's nothing down there. Nothing down here. Nothing down here. Nothing. Oh, wait, I see something. No kidding. What are the odds? What is that? It's a chariot. It's got any angels around it? What kind of chariot is this? Well, let me get a little closer. It's a foreign chariot. How do you know? Well, I see the license plates. It's out of state. What you going to do? Well, I'm just going to go on by. I'll, I'll wave. Hi, how you doing, bud? I probably can't talk his language anyhow. Wait. Is it Ethiopian? I know I can't talk Ethiopian. Pull up. Stop right here. I told you I can't talk Ethiopian. It doesn't matter. I can all right. You know the story. You know what he was? He was an ambassador. He was an ambassador for Christ. Good thing he didn't have his wife with him. I'm done. Paul's missionary trips, he sent Paul, didn't he? Sent Paul to pockets of volition. 
Now, you know, some people, listen, when you show up at a hospital or, or, or a nursing home or a high school or a gym or wherever you're going, this is for sure what you know. Or you're going like the ladies did to the Philippines and there's already a missionary there, already a missionary with boots on the field. You know what you know? Here's what you know. You got pockets of volition. You got pockets. But guess it, he don't set up, he don't send a missionary in there and he don't establish churches when there's not pockets of volition. That's pretty amazing to me. That's pretty amazing to me. And it's exactly what he did with Paul. He kept sending them to pockets. Here's the principle. You know, here the God will send people to the gospel or, or the gospel to people. Here's a principle Paul learned in Athens on his second missionary trip, Acts 17, 16 through 34, when he was in Athens. In verse 16 and 17, Paul, Paul says, Now, while I was waiting for them at Athens, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed. In other words, he was like Philip. He, he, he was waiting others to come and go have lunch with him or go to the zoo or something. You know what I mean? That's the way you're doing. Well, I'm just sitting here on the park bench waiting on a... Well, get your eyes open. Then sitting in here to sit around and wait and watch the birds. You know about the birds. You know I'm the creator of the birds. We don't need to go through that exercise. Get your eyes open on people. So I was sitting there on, a, on the park bench at Athens just looking around, and my spirit became, became provoked within me as I observed the city full of idols. He had been reasoning in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. So he's in Athens. And in the marketplace. He, let me tell you, he'd been better off in the marketplace than he was in the synagogue, wasn't he? Yeah. Neither one of them were working good in Athens. Listen, this is what he did. He did this every day. <laughs> with those who happen to be present. Isn't that good? <laughs> Sitting on the park bench, what you doing? Well, I'm waiting on people to show up because we got another gig to do. Oh, yeah? Well, how about start looking at people? I didn't say here just to sit around and do nothing, big guy. I'm going to send you people. When they didn't come to him, he got up, moved around the park and, play, the, the park and the marketplace and talked to people looking for positive volition to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do you do that, Paul? I, I can't but do it. Woe, woe unto me if I don't do this. Woe unto me if I don't do this. I can't, I can't help but do this. That's the way I feel. Why do you do, why do, you do that? I, I have to. I am compelled within my soul. My spirit compels me to do this. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't go to school to get that. Paul's sermon at Mars Hill in Acts the 17th chapter 22 through 31. Well worth your time to read sometime. Remember, God's consciousness and gospel hearing, listen to me, does not guarantee salvation. You can set, you can you can you can wind up with positive volition. And, 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 and everybody is receptive to listen to you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That don't mean they're going to get saved. It means that you have the privilege to give them a hearing. That's all that means. Each person must personally believe the gospel of grace salvation in order to be saved. You know, John 3.16 or Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Paul reminds us in every epistle he writes in his salutation of this doctrinal principle about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel principle up there that says God brings people to the gospel or the gospel to people. That is the truth. 
a good example of that is Romans, the first chapter. You need to read that through at least verse 17. Here's the second thing I think Paul learned. Because you see it in his missionary trips. Paul learned it was essential to give a clear gospel of grace salvation. And for Paul, a clear gospel had two parts to it. There had to be the message that Christ came and died at a cross, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And there had to be a mechanics. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself, nor the law or any other thing. And buddy, I can tell you that will divide you in a heartbeat. Number one hate mail I have gotten over my 42, three years, how many, what's that, 40, 74 to whatever we are. After a while, you can't count anymore. 43. 43. 43. And end of the year, I'll be 43. Four, fourth year. 40, 44 years. How did that happen? Having fun. Having fun. I am. I know that. <clears throat> Listen, cl clarity. Clarity of both these. The uh, number one hate mail I get is, is my, I stick to my guns on this thing. The gospel is Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. And in order to be saved, you've got to believe that he does all the work and you can add nothing to it. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. And where did I get that? I got it from Paul. That's where I got it. I got it from the champion of grace. That's where I got it. We must not assume everybody understands the truth of these two issues for grace salvation on the mission field. You can read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, and you know that. People may assume that they are saved because they believe the gospel message, but don't believe the mechanics of grace salvation. Listen, it's a duel. The message has to be right. The mechanics have to be right. Listen, if you don't do it right, then God has to bring somebody else because you've, you fumbled the ball. He's going to have to bring somebody off the bench to get it done. Listen, this is really clear in the first church conference in Acts 15. This thing was just as clear as a bell. There was a whole group of people that believed that, that their, their theology said, you've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul said that's absolutely false and it's not true. That's discussed in verse 1 and verse 5 and cleared up in verse 11. We are saved by grace through faith and not of itself as a gift of God is what came out of that. And what happened to the church in the church conference is the church was split right down the middle. There was a legalistic church that believed that works were essential for salvation and spirituality and the grace church that said, no way, Jose. Let me show you something about, let me show you something, write this down because I didn't put it down there, on Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Let me give you something. In, in Ephesians 2, 5 and 8, Paul says, for by grace are you saved. He says it in verse 5 and he says it in verse 8. For by grace are you saved. All right? Both in verse 5 and verse 8, Paul does something really unique. He, these, both times when he says you are saved, he puts them in a perfect paraphrastic. Both of them are perfect. Now, a perfect paraphrastic means that there is a, an imy verb. There's an imy verb. That's an is. There's an imy, what we call an imy verb, is, was. We call it an absolute status quo verb of existence. 
when that's used with God, he is the I am. Who shall, that, you know, in Exodus 3.14? Except in the Hebrew, it's not Aimi, it's Hayah. H-A-Y-A-H. Who shall I say sent me? You tell him, I am who I am sent you. <laughs> I am the I am. And it's a, it's a verb of absolute status quo existence. So in this passage, this is a, a present active, uh, no, uh, uh, well, it's a, a, it's a present, I wrote this down because, yeah, it's a present active indicative, second pre in Ephesians 2, 5, and 8. And then it has um, sozo, sozo, and that's a perfect passive participle, nominative, plural, masculine. And because of this, and this is a paraphrase, we, in the old days, when I went to school, we used to call that helping verbs. We call them helping verbs. Yeah. But this, this, but actually it's a paraphrastic. And it becomes, the paraphrastic has to have this imi in it. And it's a perfect paraphrastic. That, that's because we have this combination working to emphasize something big time. It's called, a para, para, it's called a perfect paraphrastic because it goes by, by that verb, the strength of, the, of that verb. So it's called a perfect paraphrastic. Now here's what's interesting. This perfect tense is connected with that indicative. That's a, pre, that's, that's a present, that's a, a, a continuous reality, indicative of reality that is sta that's in a completed state. See, the perfect tense means a completed state. It, what was true in the past is true now, is true forever. That's verse 5 and verse 8. You want, you want to talk about eternal life security? That gives you assurance. That's a present indicative with a perfect participle. That's a paraphrastic that just, just, there is no, there is no re, way to rebuck that. There's no rebuttal with that. You can't rebuke, rebuke, rebu you can't rebuttal that. May have to loosen up my shoes a little bit. My, it's affecting my tongue. <clears throat> That, that, that's a powerful, listen, you know, we use these great passages, 2.5 two, two and 2.8, right? For by grace, but for by grace are you saved? Listen, that's dynamite. Somewhere I'd write that in the back of my Bible when somebody goes, oh, well, you'll be saved today and lost tomorrow. Ah, ah. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Paul Paul, he said a lot more than he said when he said, for by grace are you saved through faith. He said a lot more than you can imagine, he said. <laughs> because, boy, he knocked it out of the ballpark with that idea. Do you see that? In Acts 15, 11, when they finally settled down that you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves the gift of God, you can't add anything to it. It nullifies it. That's what he said in Galatians 2.21. He says it nullifies grace. You can't be saved without grace. Works cannot save you. The work of Christ has to save you 100%. Jeez. So he says in Acts 15.11, something like, No, we believe it through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are all saved the same way, whether Jew or Gentile. Rich or poor, you know, whatever you want to do. Well, don't you think that it's enough if you just believe the gospel and then just do whatever else you want in order to be saved? Isn't it important that you just believe the gospel? Well, it depends on what you're talking about salvation. Yes, the work of Christ is finished. Therefore, I can't add anything to that. So you must not. Well, I think I could, if I just believe the gospel, I could walk an aisle and be saved. What do you think walking the aisle? That, well, it's necessary. Or join a church or whatever. It nullifies grace. Without grace, you cannot be saved. 
Gee whiz. This, write me and send me the letters. <laughs> because I am persuaded about what I'm teaching. Third, the third thing, third thing that Paul learned was first teach them basic doctrines of salvation. Don't make a trip thinking that somebody else has covered it. Don't go out there and say, well, you know, probably so-and-so. Teach, teach basic doctrines on salvation. It's necessary to secure believers in God's grace. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? In respect to their salvation. So they can be secured in respect. So they can be secured in respect to their salvation. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 2, Paul says, I gave you milk. I couldn't give you meat. I gave you milk. I mean, how important it is it? Listen, I, I've been in churches that have been in existence a long time. They, listen, they needed m milk. They, there's no way you could have given meat. You go in, you throw out something, you go like, whew, I'm going to have to readjust this whole thing. Right there on your feet, you got to go, like, whoa, I was planning to talk about this. I can't do that. They don't understand. You know what I'm saying? So you got to go back to, you got you to build it up. You can't, so that you, I went in with meat, and now I'm down to milk. You know? So sometimes you got to be on your feet. You got to think on your feet. I've been in church where I thought, well, the pastor probably has covered some of this stuff. I get in there and I throw out, I begin to check it. You know, I throw out some stuff and they go, people look at me like, are you kidding? And I go like, oh, wow. I got to start from scratch. So I probably won't be here but a day or so. <laughs> They'll scratch me. Listen, here's another thing. On, uh, wh wherever you go, be sure to leave your teaching material with key scriptures printed out. And listen, if you're in a, if you're, listen, if you're in a aged home, if you're in a retirement home, you gotta up your, you gotta up your fonts. You can't go in there with eleven and twelve, right? You can't go in there with eleven and twelve fonts. You can't go in there with uh, fourteen, sixteen. Something like that. I learned that from Chuck Farmer, too. I went in there with 11s. Chuck says, you might as well leave that in a car. Why do you have any? Look at their glasses, and you know that 11 ain't going to work. I said, well, let me see what you got. <laughs> they were like 16s. Now we're ready to go into the nursing home. <laughs> leave, leave what you teach, leave. Listen, they're desperate for materials. They are desperate, right? Oh, they are desperate. Didn't you find that, Rick? People are desperate for materials over there. I mean, they're just desperate. I mean, and so, sometimes if you didn't print out the scriptures, they have a Bible. They have a Bible. I mean, at least give them some. And, uh, yeah, well, yeah, and listen, that's because you got a missionary trying to push them out there. If you didn't have a missionary, you wouldn't have that, would you? Probably. People, what kind of a person? Well, yeah. Now, also, we have a lot of material on our website. You go to doctoralstudies.com. You go to our webpage and you look for things like, for example, you're going to run into a, a, a something's called the interactive Bible study. What you're looking for, what you're looking for is New Life Promises. There's a booklet that Chuck wrote called New Life Promises. It's excellent. You want that. You want that. Also, on that website, you want to go in and you want to look at Christian Warrior. Christian Warrior. If you're, if you're dealing with basic doctrines on salvation, you want the basic. There's two levels of the Christian warrior. There's the basic and the advanced. You want the basic. Save your, save your the advanced the next time you go. 
There's the pamphlet on there called The 50 Things. These are all really good materials uh, for that first visit on, on the dealing with salvation. All that is on our web. It's absolutely free. However, understand, for those on the Internet, you're, you're more than welcome to have this material and use it. Do not sell it. Do not sell any material that comes off our website. Do not sell it. Jeez. Good grief. Here's the fourth thing. Paul learned, and, and listen, this is a key. Paul learned the importance of returning to the previous mission field to teach advanced doctrines of the Christian life. Always pay attention for a return trip. And pay attention to what their needs are. Not what you would like to teach them, but what they need to have taught them. That's one of the things that with boots on the field you'll learn by going into the retirement center is how you learn what that retirement center needs. I mean, you can go with a preconceived idea, but let me tell you, boy, that's going to be a gesture. Or you go into a, a, battered, a battered woman's shelter. Uh, or, or jails, Horton. I mean, so returning to the mission field, being able to get an idea of what they really need, what are some real spiritual needs they, they have, uh, is a key on your second trip in. Uh, when the ladies came back from the trip to the Philippines, I talked about developing three different levels of material. I'm really interested in that. I am really interested in developing that with with uh, with the ladies on that on that on that return trip. Paul's second and third missionary trips. Listen to what he said, and he does this. If he made a fourth trip, you know, there wouldn't be a fifth for him to do this. But if he made a first trip in, he always made a second trip in or a third trip. Always looking for teaching them more. How have they grown? What are they struggling with? They, they would write him letters and say, when you come back, I want you to address some important issues. Well, he would sit down, write the doctrines, and send them back. Said, no, you get them right now. We'll talk about it when I get there, right? Yeah. Listen, here, here's an important thing. So the churches were strengthened in the faith. When Paul would go back a second and third time, he paid attention to what their needs were, or they wrote and told them, or the pastors wrote and told them. Being able to coordinate your, your ministry with the boots on the field is really important. That, 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 that having that conversation with that guy with his boots on the field, what, once Paul had pastors on the field, they fed him all kinds of stuff. And we're benefits from it because look at the, look at the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans and all that. Writing back these wonderful, it just shows you the level of difference. And so that's important. The word strengthen is important. See the little word strengthen? I ran out of material and time, so I'm going to, the, 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 this word strengthened, if your Bible says established, it would be more proper. This word strengthened, it's S-T-E-R-E-O-O, -O, like stereo, like a stereo, S T E R. E O O, stereo O. It's an imperfect passive indicative. I mean, the imperfect tense is that Paul, when he went in the first trip, he gave he gave basic stuff out, secured them in their salvation. Comes in the second time, now he's building on that foundation of salvation, secured in the salvation. Now he's developing the Christian life, and then from that on, now he's just every time he goes in, he's looking. I got I've got to deal with other things. Say to me. So that's really important. Strengthen them and what? Watch this now. In two things. Watch this. Str so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in their numbers. Listen to me. In the Greek language, that's cause and effect. The, the, those are our prepositions. Strengthen and grew. Look at The churches were strengthened in their faith and grew 
there, there is in the Greek language, there's something interesting. I'm going to show you that because I, I'm, my time's all over the ballpark anyhow. Sometimes chi is used in a very interesting way. It's called an adjunctive. It's called an adjunctive conjunction. <laughs> it's called adjunctive. And when it's used, it's because he, he's bringing two nouns together that are important or two verbs. In this case, it's two verbs. Now, I want to show them to you because he links these two for cause and effect. Cause and effect. Watch this. He says, so the churches were strengthened. Strengthened. That's one verb. Strengthened. That's one verb over here. Strengthened. With a chi. It's strengthened in the faith, right? Chi. And then another verb. And another preposition. The, so we got a strengthened, and then we got the word grew. Now, this, this uh, verb for strengthen was an imperfect indicative. The other verb over here, grew, is an imperfect indicative. You see, now you can say, oh, wow, I can see that. Mm, they belong together. That's cause and effect. And when you have that, you have the chi is very important because it connects these two as cause and effect or cause and result. Do you understand that? Cause and result, cause and effect. Do you understand that? Well, I, I know, but I'm just telling you. I know. doesn't cost you any extra, but that's really important. That's really important because Paul took the trouble to show you something that has a little, a little tech, technical, a, a little bit technical, that's really important to these two verbs. This cause and effect. Cause and result. He, he went to strengthen the church in their faith. As a result, the church grew in that faith. That was, see, there's two prepositional phrases. With, with the first verb, in the faith. In the second one, in the numbers. The number of the people who are going to the churches. See, the churches is plural. And so we got numbers. So he goes in, he strengthens them in their faith, and their faith grows, and they grow in number. Why? Because they're, listen, they're mature believers who are now getting active in ambassadorship. They're taking the gospel to the people. <laughs> See, Paul came in, he brought the gospel to the people. He has now trained the people. He has developed spiritual maturity in them. So now they're going, taking the gospel to their people. They're taking the gospel to their people, and their people are coming to church. That's the way the church is supposed to work. You know, we want new converts. We want them to come to church. We want to help them grow and strengthen them in their faith. They're going to die out there in the devil's world without it. So, you can go to doctrinal studies. Dot com, you could go into Christian Warrior, and there's an advanced course. There's an advanced course that says perfect for this. Also, here's also on our webpage, you can click into discipleship training. This would be good for this. There's another course in there called ambassadorship training. There's just gobs of material. They're all identified. When you go back a second or third time or as many as God would send you, you got, you got bokuts of material to start with, right? And then you add your own stuff. You spruce it up. It fits your personality, right? What are you after? Growing the, listen, strengthen the church so that the, the, the word of God can get out there into the community in an effective way locally. Now, you didn't write it down. Apparently, it's not important. Listen, I don't have to write everything on your paper for it to be important. Right? Give me a break. All right.
discipleship training and ambassadorship training should be there. All right. So you're after meat doctrines. You go in with salvation, now you're dealing with meat doctrines. Meat doctrines like spirituality versus carnality, the four life circles. The four life circles is a perfect place to teach that. Three stages of spiritual growth, teleology, the baby believer, mature, immature believer, mature believer. People don't even know that. They've been in churches all their life. They go like, well, wait. And you, so you let them have the, let, let the, let the word of God test them themselves. You don't have to go like, well, you're a bunch of babies. You just tell them what it is and say, you know, you're in there somewhere. And the Holy Spirit will go like, bah, bah. and you go like, well, there you are. <laughs> Walking by faith, not by sight. Teach the faith cycle. The six stages of grace. I mean, there's just tons and tons of material. They need to know these doctrines so they can be strengthened in their faith so that their faith can take them outside them, their own walls into their community and build their own churches. I don't need to have to keep coming back and coming back. At some point, you become an adult church, <laughs> right? You raise your own family. <laughs> okay, well, the rest of it, the rest of it is time to go. Okay, the rest of that you can read. Okay. On the, uh, the encounter, was that bringing together two, two uh, nouns or two verbs? These were two verbs. Okay. Right. Imperfect indicatives. Cause and effect. But that's that's in the Greek. So I thought when I read the Greek, it was two, the two uh, the nouns that brought together. I well, they could. Okay. This adjunctive could bring, they could bring prepositions, they could bring nouns, adjectives, All right. verbs, All right. could be most anything. All right. Yeah, that's good. All right, Rick, give us a good missionary prayer. We need a good missionary prayer. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the challenge. You uh, are always looking for our own growth, for our exhibition of our priesthood and our ambassadorship, mm. fulfill the uh, Great Commission. Mm. Uh, we are interested in the salvation of every person, every human, and uh, at least to give them a chance to Gospel. Mm. You are interested in the growth, the, the maturity of every believer. And uh, you have laid in front of us the responsibility to be your agents for that purpose. Mm. We thank you for your trust in us. Mm. But uh, most importantly, we thank you for you providing the means for us to do so through grace. Mm. Through the word, through our own growth, through our assurance of salvation, through financial means, through all, every, everything that uh, we will need to carry out that mission. Mm. Uh, help us to be aware about that mission in our in daily lives, each and every day as we go about our daily lives, as well as whatever other purposes, special purposes you have for us in life. Salute you as the source of all grace. And as our one that well, to whom we represent the world of Christ and Christ. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him.